guess we're not going to hear the voice that we're recording, but we are in fact recording now. So I'm going to mute everyone except for the presenters. You can unmute yourself um, if you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment. Um, but to cut down on background noise, um, I'll keep everyone muted in the meantime. Um, so um, with that, um, Yvonne, we're ready to begin. Ivan, oh. I see it now. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> so anyway, welcome all who were able to make it tonight. This is, um, we think, a very uh, record well attended lecture. And so we hope that people will enjoy it. Um, this is a rain garden, home rain garden panel discussion being sponsored by the Riverside Public Library and conjointly with the Frederick Law Olmsted Society of Riverside. My purpose here, Don Lucero, is as the moderator and my relationship to this is that I am the current president of the Olmsted Society. Um, we, uh, we were hoping, or perhaps we were uh, designing our uh, uh, subject of interest to the fact that we do get spring rain. Um, and so rain gardens are an increasingly popular um, solution to having um, frequent puddles in our yards. Uh, but as we needed rain this particular spring anyway, nature has cooperated these past mm. couple of days. So it's timely that we're together tonight. And I understand that there is supposed to be a fair amount of rain next week. So stay tuned for the critical information you may need. <laughs> um, I do wanna just highlight that our speakers will give you um, a little bit about themselves in terms of background. We have five panel members um, and the discussion will address eight main topics, um, followed by comments from the speakers, as well as taking questions from the audience. But please, please, as Dan just mentioned, uh, type in those questions using the chat option if you can, so we could kind of organize um, similar topics or perhaps um, linked questions and move uh, along with the information that you're interested in. I don't think that any of you probably really want to spend the entire evening on Zoom. <laughs> I, know, I doubt that, uh, I have no doubt that some people are already exhausted by it today. Um, mm -hmm. But without further ado, I will um, call upon our first uh, panel member, Jenny, to tell you a little bit about your, herself and why she's talking on our panel tonight. Hi everybody, I'm Ginny. I live in Brookfield now um, and I've lived in the area for most of my life. Um, I lived in North Riverside in Forest Park growing up, went to Hauser Junior High and Riverside Brookfield High School. Um, and then after living in Chicago for a while, came back to settle in Brookfield with my family. I've um, lived in my house since 2012 and we have flooded since 2012. <laughs> We're pretty close to Salt Creek. Um, and so ever since we moved in and I got introduced to, to a yard full of water, I've um, started to manage my rain garden. Um, professionally, I am a nurse. I've worked in nonprofit health for over 10 years. And right now I work at a nonprofit milk bank. And um, I've kind of come to the community through the Master Naturalist program with UIC Extension or U of I Extension. Um, I work with adopt a spot in Palos. I do stewardship in Brookfield Woods, and I do plants of concern monitoring with Chicago Botanic Garden, as well as work um, on the team with Val for conservation at home. So right now I do evaluations for those houses that have rain gardens and native grasses and native plants um, so that you can be recognized for, for having that sort of stewardship in your yard. So thank you for having me today. Okay, John. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, my name is John Haugland. I'm a Riverside resident. We moved here in 2004. And in 
and when we moved and bought this house, um, we knew right away that there were water problems. Um, and in 2005, we um, installed a rain garden and then 2006, a prairie garden next to it and been enjoying them ever since. Okay. I was waiting for that last person to be admitted. Um, okay. Great. Okay. Um, Laura. Hi, I'm Laura. Um, my husband and I moved here in 2010 and literally on the day we moved in, we discovered that we had a backyard that flooded. Um, it started pouring halfway through our move and our backyard started filling up. Um, so it was unusable for the first five years or so that we lived here. And then we installed um, a rain garden, but we actually have a redundant system. So we actually have a rain exchange system as well as the rain garden, um, which has transformed our yard into an unusable space to a completely livable space. Great. All right, Sean. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, I'm Sean. Um, I'm a uh, I'm a Riversider as well. Um, I've uh, lived in Riverside since 2010. I'm a, 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 a um, ecological restoration contractor professionally. Um, I have a landscape architecture degree from um, University of Illinois, and uh, I've been doing ecological restoration work, um, including um, um, alternative stormwater management installations for about 17 years. I uh, currently work for Simplify Land Services in Yorkville, and um, um, I, uh, I lead the uh, Ecological Restoration Division of the company. Okay, and Valerie. Hello there, everyone. Um, thank you, um, Riverside Library, and um, to this organization for having me. Um, my name is Val Kehoe. I am the Energy and Environmental Stewardship Coordinator for uh, University of Illinois Extension. Um, and uh, programs that I focus on are the Conservation at Home Program, which is a partnership with the Forest Preserve of Cook County, along with um, the Master Naturalist Program. And I've seen a couple naturalists that are on the call today, as well as Jenny, who's one of our wonderful volunteers in both programs. So it's a real pleasure. Okay. Um, I was just going to go over the first two uh, I should say uh, linked oh. topics. Oh, excuse me, Yvonne. Yes. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. <laughs> oh, my God, Dan, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Hey. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dan Murphy. Um, I've been in Riverside for 20 years, but we've been in our current house for seven years. Um, the, um, our, the backyard um, we knew was a problem um, within a year or two um, of, of moving in. Um, and uh, for a number of years, I just um, placed a small pump um, at the back of the yard and uh, uh, pumped out the, the surface water. Um, so, but I'm brand new to rain gardening. Um, my wife and I dug a rain garden um, last summer, and I'll go into the whole saga of that when we uh, share our experiences with rain gardens. But um, uh, professionally, I work uh, for Northwestern uh, University, um, managing a distance learning uh, technology team. And um, um, we'll probably have learned more t tonight than uh, I have to say on the subject. So I'm grateful for the other panelists. Well, let me point out that that's one of the reasons why Dan is in charge of our technology because <laughs> <laughs> he's got it together. And he does the same thing for our Olmstead meetings, I'm oh. glad to say as oh. well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so just so everybody's on the same page, and because these topics kind of are linked and may seep into one another, we're going to have our um, panelists talk a little bit about, first of all, what are the key elements of a rain garden and what would the benefits of that rain garden be? So I think we're going to continue in the uh, cycle we started. And so Ginny can go ahead and put her thoughts out there first. So I'm going to talk mostly about the um, benefits of rain gardens because um, I've seen um, so many of them since I've been doing this. Um, I started my rain garden in 2014, so it's about seven years old. Um, 
I think the rain water management is one of the biggest factors for us. It's not completely tr controlling the water in our yard, but it's managed it significantly and there's room for growth. So I think that's fantastic. Um, also, it's been great for the kids because they see the way that nature works really well um, on our property. Um, they're enjoying the wildlife and they're enjoying the flowers, the seasons change, and there's a lot of interest throughout all the seasons. Um, and then I do a lot of wild crafting too. So there's certain um, plants that you can use to make tinctures and um, liqueurs and teas. And that's a really wonderful benefit of having the rain garden plants on our property. Um, and then I think one of the most important things for me has been the community. So being able to start digging this um, rain garden, having people stop and look and see what I'm doing and, and why I'm doing my gardening in kind of a different way, um, being able to share the plants and propagate them with each other and then find community with people like the master naturalists and other neighbors on the block. So it's just been a, a breadth of benefits that have come from it. John. Um, yeah, I would uh, I would just uh, talk a little bit about the uh, the elements of a rain garden, um, and, and basically in its it's it's in its simplest form, a rain garden is simply a, a depression, uh, a vegetated depression where uh, rainwater is directed to uh, to sit and infiltrate, um, and the idea being that uh, the water infiltrates quickly, typically within twenty four hours. Um, Ideally, you would plant it with deep-rooted native vegetation. Um, native vegetation helps uh, infiltrate the water. Um, they can be specifically engineered to, uh, to hold a specific volume of water. They can have uh, engineered soils. They can, have, um, they can be connected to storm sewers um, in their more uh, complex versions. But, um, but I would say like any, any rain garden is a benefit. So something as simple as a, you know, as a small depression that's vegetated um, is better than no rain garden at all. Okay. John, what do you think? Um, I think uh, <laughs> what, what Sean just said all uh, makes sense to me. Um, and uh, the nice thing that I found about my rain garden, um, um, it was well-designed. Um, I didn't do the design myself, but um, with some extra storage capacity below the depression underground. Um, we've had a lot of water come in and it's filled up in heavy rains, but it dissipates really quickly. There's, it's only a matter of hours that there's ever any standing water if it's designed correctly. Wow, that's great. No fish in the backyard, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Laura, what do you, would you like to add here? Well, it's all the same what they're saying, you know, with the with the vegetation and the deep rooted um, plants, it helps keep the soil aer aerated so it doesn't let it compact. Um, when water sits on the on soils, it compacts and then it doesn't even allow it to absorb the wa water. So mm -hmm. with having the, the right plants in there, it lets it get down into it and, and it does drain a lot faster than it did when it was all over my entire yard. It, it still drains faster when it's in, in a much smaller because we have swales leading the water into the rain garden. So that the rain garden absorbs it much quicker than the, the entire yard did. Okay. Um, Valerie, how would you like to <laughs> put uh, all this together? Right. Well, um, so ditto with everything that um, that has already been spoken about. Um, they are beautiful. They provide um, so many more benefits. Um, but mostly um, a rain garden, the heart of a rain garden is um, uh, water, right? And particularly storm water and, and preventing that runoff. Um, clean water is essential to our planet, um, to ourselves. Um, and um, it's the runoff that um, isn't filtrated into the soil that's having impact on our water as well as our land. Um, it's uh, the EPA estimates that um, pollutants uh, runoff accounts for 70% of the water pollution. And um, the biggest pollutant in Illinois is not chemicals, but actually the soil erosion. Um, so if you think of like the muddy Mississippi, right? Um, 
So um, it's it's the soil sediment and what's um, what's um, being picked up along the way that's causing the problem. So these rain gardens do help, um, as everybody is, um, Sean and Laura and um, Ginny have already described. It is um, these rain gardens that are able to absorb so much more of the stormwaters and um, pollutants. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I know that some folks have some nice um, slides of their individual gardens. Ginny, I think you have some. Would you like to go ahead and show those to the group so they can kind of start putting these um, thoughts uh, to some un greater understanding pictorially? Yep, let me open it up. All right. Oh, well, I gotta start at the beginning. Hold on. <laughs> Can everybody see them? Yeah. So I started rain gardening mostly because I needed to put in a rain garden, but I did it kind of for a therapeutic purpose. I had a difficult loss in my family. So I started getting outside and shoveling and raking and decided that's when I was going to put in my rain garden. Um, and I hand dug my rain garden. So for those of you that don't have one yet, you know, you can do them yourself. You can hire someone, you can do both, but, um, for me, I was able to do it by hand and dig, dig it all up. Um, you'll see here how bad it gets in my yard. Um, I'm at the lower end of the alley uh, or the lower end of the um, water level in my alley. So I get it from all sides. You can see the garages on the back contributes to my yard. So I have depressions that kind of help um, bring the water throughout the yard and to other places. Um, one thing about native gardens that help with the rain gardens is that they're adapted to withstand our weather. So they can be flooded, they can be frozen, they can get snow in April, they can freeze, and then they're gonna make it back next year and often in better shape than they started. Um, here's my front yard. So you can get a visual of how I use it in the front. Um, I have a little bit higher of a garden bed next to my house and then my depression is further away. I know there's specifications that um, maybe some of the other panels will talk about about how far away from the house you should be, um, but this is my biggest rain garden is in the front and it's the deepest and you can see that I have additional garden beds that continue to take in the water. Um, and you can see on the left here that when it's just a little bit of water, you know, it kind of sits in there, it drains within 24 hours, like Sean mentioned. Um, and then in some of the rougher floods, it kind of gets a little bit further than that. But I attribute that to the creek, not my, my digging job. Mm -hmm. um, here's another show of my rain garden. You can see that it changes throughout the season. So these native plants are going to start really little. Um, you can leave some of the vegetation up during the winter for some nice appeal, um, but they start kind of small and then throughout the season they really start to grow and fill in really beautifully. So for those of you that may be concerned about how it looks in the front, um, I found that there's so many ways that you can make it look really beautiful. Um, here's the side in the backyard again, you can see all the water on the side here, and then how I've built my swale kind of leading from the back to the front. This one's not as deep as it could be. Um, but it's, you know, it's again, a start. Any, any rain garden is better than none in my case here. Here's another view of my backyard. And then here's kind of where I got to last year. It was about a year ago last year, after many years of rain gardening, realizing that I might need more help than just the plants. So there are times where a rain garden is going to be enough for your rain management. But in other cases, if you're closer to the water or you're getting lots of flood because you're living on the floodplain, um, other things may help. So we use a pump to help us. Both of my, na my neighbors use them as well. And we carry the water from the back to the front. Hopefully the rain garden is still taking up a bit of the water because of the plants but we are moving it forward a little bit. And I know that there's some other panelists that may have other systems that help with, with what the plants can't accomplish. Um, that's all I got here. John or Laura, do you have um, pictures you'd like to share? Um, I do, Laura, do you, you wanna go first? I, I can, I don't have a ton of pictures um, and, I, and I don't have as detailed as pictures of my garden itself. Um, but I will show you, um, let's see. So this is kind of the reason we started the rain garden. 
because this is how much my my yard would collect. Um, and this okay. is the rain exchange system. Um, so it's a 2,500 gallon tank that we put under permeable pavers that will collect the water from the garage roof. Laura, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt, um, yeah. but I, I don't think we're seeing the pictures full size. Oh. I, do you have a second monitor? I don't. Um, okay. Um, yeah, maybe if we double click on one of them. Or... It's full size we're just on seeing my the, screen. Really? We're just seeing the thumbnails. Oh, um, you're probably um, just sharing your Windows Explorer and not your um, photo viewer. So uh -huh. what, what you could do is stop sharing and then just uh, share your desktop. Because I know, yeah, I know I want your uh, rain garden uh, management system is pretty interesting. I want to make sure people can see what that's all about. Uh, I can try again here. Okay. Is that any better? No, we're just seeing uh, Windows Explorer again. Um, maybe if you minimize Windows Explorer. I'll try. The picture's Sorry. behind it. Oh, no, no, these things happen. That's why we need Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I know it worked the other night. It did work the other night, so I'm not sure what's what's going on. Better? Uh, no, the same thing. We're just seeing the thumbnails from Windows Explorer. Hmm. Do you want to uh, send them to me, and we'll we'll come back to you? Sure. Okay, if you want to just email them to me. That would be great. Um, and then, um, John, do you want to go ahead in the meanwhile? Sure. I just have a few. Um, let me um, share screen. Um, okay. So, oh, there's my plant list, but that's not where I'm going yet. Um, okay. So, this is. Uh, can you see that picture? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, these are handheld iPhone pictures earlier today of hard copy pictures that I pulled out of a. <laughs> so, so you see the reflection of my of my phone there. Mm -hmm. um, this is in 2006. Um, they dug it out so that they could put. Um, I think it was a four foot by four foot, and I'm not sure how deep. Maybe one foot. Um, uh, gravel um, storage capacity, and then they filled that over. Um, and, uh, okay, can you see the next one? Yes. Okay, so um, we had this design to have the um, downspout on the right side of the house can, with the sump um, with the sump uh, pipe and then uh, another downspout on the left side. So there are three sources of, of water, two downspouts and one sump. And they, they came out into this area that this is now, this is, this is covered over, the, the gravel is covered over, so that's why you can't see it. And um, in addition to that, there was a, a swale coming from the right um, into, from the, the right side of the house um, coming into the rain garden. And then uh, let me go to the next one. Oh, just going in order here. Yeah, this is um, what came from the downspots and the sump pump into the rain garden. Um, and then we're filled over some of the plants that we had started. Um, and then there's <laughs> a long time ago. Um, uh, and then uh, plants put in and mulch, and we had soaker hoses put in um, as well. 
which we used for the first year to help help them uh, um, uh, to help them water and develop their roots and all. But we didn't need them after the first year. Uh, I think I got one more, or a couple more. Um, that's after one year. Um, so you can see it's still a mulch garden. And then here's after two years. So 2007 or 2008, so you can see it's, it's uh, filling out there. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have one more recently, but this is like, uh, if you come by, this is the corner of Delaplane and Herrick. Um, come by in a, in a couple months and, and you'll be surprised <laughs> at how lush it is. Um, it's spectacular. It is, yep. And so, um, like I said earlier, th this area fills when there's a real heavy rain, it fills up all the way to the top. And there's an even little, little bit of a depression here that goes out to the sidewalk um, and the street as an overflow. But I've only seen water trickle through there um, half a dozen times in the last 10 years. So it really does soak up a lot of water. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll stop sharing there at that, this point. Okay. Are we back to Laura's pictures? Um, let me see here. Um, get those uh, open. Let me, uh, give me one second. Why don't we uh, hear from someone else? And I'll have those ready in a minute. Actually, maybe I'll ask a question just because okay seeing John's pictures made me think of this and I hadn't considered it before. As you pointed out, John, this was sort of a mulch garden initially, and then you showed um, a slightly later version, but it still had mulch. So uh, I'm really happy to have anybody from the panels address this. Would that be a chronic need? Um, or do you think that's just kind of one of those little helper techniques that you would use to bridge the first couple of years until things got established? The latter. I haven't put mulch on it for years. Okay. I actually never use mulch for my rain gardens. Oh, good to know. All right. So it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not necessary. It does help though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I only put it on once a year for aesthetics usually. Mm-hmm. Right, I, um, actually along the border um, where people are walking along the sidewalk, I have some mulch there to make it, to make them think that it's uh, more managed than it is. <laughs> <laughs> Valerie, do you have some uh, additional comments or photos? Um, well, the mulch um, actually helps to get the plants established. It'll help to re uh, retain the um, water. Um, it does, uh, the first couple years, kind of define the edge and make it look like a purposeful garden. Um, it may help to re uh, reduce any weeds, too. Um, um, but actually, the plants will fill out. Um, and another nice um, mulch resource that you could use is just mulching up your leaves in the fall and putting that on your bed, that will break down into organic matter, um, which is um, an easy peasy uh, resource to reuse. Okay, and here's another um, query that doesn't really need illustration, but mostly just commentary. Do all gardens need gravel added to drain properly? No. Um, mine does not have one, any. John, what do you do? What do I do? Um, I, I uh, audit multi-million dollar um, uh, sediment remediation projects in the Great Lakes. Oh, <laughs> no, that's <laughs> what I meant about gravel, actually. <laughs> um, but you had uh, had some put in initially. I, I did have, the, there's a um, storage capacity of gravel. Um, underneath the rain garden. Um, I agree with Sean, that's not necessary. Um, but um, we wanted to have some extra, we, we were dealing with some very heavy um, uh, water problems. And so we wanted just to make sure that we had the capacity um, to handle some real heavy storms. Okay. 
Yeah, so that's that's the main function of, of adding gravel. Um, it's it's kind of like having a French drain um, underneath your rain garden. So um, it just adds storage capacity uh, to the uh, uh, water storage capacity. So um, so it'll hold more water. John, I'm ready with Laura's uh, slides now. All right, what perfect timing. All right. So can we, uh, can you all see them? I think this is slide number one, isn't it, Laura? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so this is after a moderate rain. This is um, shortly after we moved in. Um, so you can see it just kind of, it was coming up all the way to the front of the yard. Um, and it, the yard was actually completely unusable um, because we couldn't even, there was so much water and it just sat there that if you'd walk back there, you'd get covered in mosquitoes. You'd get, it, it was just a, a buggy, nasty mess back there. So we never even used the backyard. Um, and if you go to the next one, you can see it with a little bit heavier rain. Oh, oh. that's that's what it looks like now. Yeah, where's uh, number two? Let's see. Oh, here. Sorry. So as you can see, it's the whole backyard and in front of the garage. So it was only this little area in the front that that didn't get water, and it would get probably a foot and a half deep towards the back of the yard. So number three um, is the rain exchange system. So this is a 2,500 gallon tank that was put underneath a permeable paver patio. And there is channels that, that direct water from the garage roof into this tank. And there's a water feature that recirculates the, the water to keep it fresh. And then I have a pump that I can use the water then to water my grass, my flowers, my, my garden beds um, and for any time after that time. And it's a redundant system because really the first line of defense for the flooding is the rain garden. And then whatever doesn't go into the rain garden then goes into the tank. And if the tank overflows, the, the Riverside actually had us directed out to the sewer system. Um, and we try never to get to that spot. We always, if, if it's gonna rain too much, we'll use the water that's in the tank to add the capacity so that we're not kicking it out to the, to the sewer system. And then the next couple of pictures are what the yard looks like now um, versus this is, so you can see this is after rain and where the water is now contained. Um, and there are swales in the back that direct the water right to that spot so that the, the rain, uh, the rain garden is what collects the rain. But then we have a lot more usable space. And this is, this was just last week, we were getting the yard ready and um, this is before all the plants started growing in this year. Um, but you can, you can kind of see how it swales in there at the, at the tree that's kind of cut off. And, you know, we've added river birch and, and other trees that will kind of um, absorb some of that water as well. And then the next photo, this is the, the permeable paver patio. So any of the water that goes onto the pavers goes directly into that rain, rain exchange system as well further giving capacity to the water situation. Wow. Thanks. Well, um, if there's other comments, please jump in. All right. um, um, oh, excuse me, Yvonne. Um, I was going to show uh, my progress to date. <laughs> The forgotten man. I am the forgotten man. That's all right. No, oh, I feel bad. No, oh, don't don't feel bad. I'm like he's going to fix another technical problem. Right. <laughs> I'm just the AV guy, but no, I uh, <laughs> have a little experience with uh, with the rain gardens. So I will share my desktop here. So um, let's see. So I prepared a few slides just to give you an idea of what it looks like. And then I have some actual photos. So um, this is the rain garden that my wife Olivia and I built. Um, it uh, we dug entirely by hand, uh, 13 by 19. Initially, it was going to be 18 inches deep. Um, and then we, um, we brought in Sean Sin um, to consult with us. And he gave us two, um, you know, and I had questions, you know, is this big enough? Is it going to be adequate? Um, and he gave me two um, well, he gave me many good pieces of advice, but the two most memorable one were um, any rain garden is better than none at all. And the second one was keep digging. <laughs> so initially the rain garden was only gonna be 18 inches deep. We thought, well, we've made a depression in the ground, good enough. 
Um, but then um, Sean's keep digging advice was, was followed with, you need to break through the clay layer. So um, this was the, the basic outline of our rain garden. And then um, we did put a berm, but only around three sides of the rain garden because um, the rain garden is at the bottom of a, a downward slope. Uh, it's at the far back corner of our yard and the yard slopes towards that corner. So um, to catch the water coming down the pretty gentle hill, uh, we just really needed a berm on, on three sides. Um, this part of the, of the rain garden is definitely lower than the surrounding ground, um, but this is this part here has been built up uh, where you see the berm. And so um, we followed Sean's keep digging advice and we did break through the clay layer. And um, oh, oh, we discovered that um, the uh, percolation test, which I think we'll talk about later in the presentation, um, produced some very favorable results. Basically, I dug a 12 inch hole, filled it with water and then timed to see how fast the water would drain. And once, um, once we dug this pit, this basin uh, at the level of 30 inches deep, then um, the water drained within a half hour. And I, I couldn't believe my good fortune. I did another test and it drained in 45 minutes, another one, uh, 50 minutes. And, I, and typically you just do three tests like that. And um, the fourth test, it started to rain, um, but um, it still drained within an hour or so. So it was very, you know, conditions were very favorable for a rain garden there. And then, um, so that is uh, kind of the design of the rain garden. And I have some pictures to share here. Let's see. Just have to find the right application. Here it is. Okay, and we'll get this started. So this is uh, May 18th of last spring. Let's stop that. Um, and it had rained, uh, I think we had two or three heavy rains in the a week or so before that. And uh, we woke up on the 18th to found, find a uh, about 50, 60% of the yard underwater. Um, in the past, this area at the back by the neighbor's fence was uh, where most of the flooding occurred. But after um, you know, several heavy rains and then a particularly heavy rain that the night before, uh, the entire yard was under uh, several inches of water. It was probably close to a foot deep here in the back corner and like, uh, six to eight inches um, here in the foreground. Um, and so, um, my wife is an avid gardener, I, I help out. Um, and I knew that um, a lot of the trees and plants um, that were in the yard would be ruined <clears throat> if, um, if we didn't get the water out quickly. So I um, went to Jack's Tool Rental in Berwyn and rented the largest pump that would fit in my car. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> the intake and outlet hoses on this pump um, are fire hoses essentially. And so I ran the pump for two days um, I, I shut it off at 11 at night to avoid uh, annoying the neighbors too much. Um, but then like seven o'clock the following morning, I, I was running it again and managed to get, after two days of running this kind of construction site sort of pump and managed to get most of the water out of the yard, but not so much that uh, ducks didn't still find it attractive. Um, you can, it's a little, a little blurry, but you can see a male and female duck there in the, the puddles that are still left in, in our yard. So um, around that time, the uh, Village of Riverside newsletter included an article about uh, building a rain garden. And um, I, my wife and I had considered, you know, um, what could we do to make our yard more usable, better drained? And um, we'd been thinking about a rain garden and that got us really thinking about it combined with the, the flood that had just occurred. And so we uh, started doing some research. And then in July of last year, <clears throat> we, uh, we canceled the vacation to Wisconsin and thought, well, we've got a week off, let's start digging. Um, so we dug and dug and dug some more. And uh, at this point, um, you know, we really hadn't, uh, um, we, we followed the advice of the, the guidebooks and things like that. And we thought we were done until uh, we talked to Sean. And then uh, he gave his uh, excellent keep digging advice because um, this image here is not uh, the wall of the Grand Canyon. It's the profile of the soil. And you can see um, there's several inches of nice uh, rich topsoil on top, but then it's pure clay um, below that. And so when I had first done the percolation test um, to see uh, if the area was suitable for a rain garden, I was digging up here at the surface and, and the drainage was, was okay, but um, not remarkable. But it's only after I dug through the clay layer, as, as Sean suggested, 
and then retested that it got the really dramatic um, drainage. And so this is the, the sort of pure clay that we dug right out, you know, dug out of the ground. Um, there I am standing in the basin that became the, the, the place where we put uh, the engineered soil and what in, the engineered soil in our case was a mixture of sand, compost, um, and topsoil with the majority of it being sand. Um, here's my wife wondering why we're doing this. No, she is, uh, was as enthusiastic about doing it as I was and probably worked harder on the whole project than I did. Um, here's the about three and a half cubic yards of clay we removed from the yard. Though this was a do-it-yourself project. Um, we did hire a landscaper to haul all that clay away. There's no way we could have used it in our yard. So um, we decided to um, put um, gravel on top instead of mulch for the rain garden. And the reason we did that is um, we've probably invested thousands of dollars in mulch over the years. And of course, the thing about mulch is you have to reapply it um, periodically. It disintegrates to soil. And I um, had seen in a book, a landscape photography book, a picture of a dolomite, um, dolomite prairie uh, which is basically a gravel prairie with wildflowers growing through it, through the uh, the rocky soil, and I thought, well, um, you know, wondered if that was a solution for our rain garden. And in fact, um, uh, the book um, that I one of the books that I relied on recommended um, gravel as a as a alternative to mulch. And so, um, just really quickly about the the um, the uh, choice of gravel, our first thought was to um, go to a quarry and um, you know, kind of go direct to the source and buy um, gravel wholesale. Um, and it um, technically, you know, it wasn't feasible because quarries aren't meant to serve, you know, residential customers. Um, but uh, second of all, the kind of quarry, uh, gravel you would get at a quarry um, is made to compact. It's used for road building and you want uh, a gravel that is going to um, maintain uh, air gaps and, and water gaps between um, each piece of stone. So it's just as well we didn't get the kind of gravel we might have gotten at a quarry, even if it were available. So we spread uh, of about three and in, three inches of gravel over the entire rain garden. Um, I do have a pump as a backup in case uh, the rain garden can't uh, manage uh, you know, to, to drain the water promptly. Um, interestingly enough, the rain garden has never been put to the test. We finished it last September and we haven't had a, such a heavy rain as we, we had back in May that was the whole you know, motivation for building a rain garden. Um, this is my uh, water course that, uh, my, my creek bed that uh, leads to the pump. Um, this is how it looked um, when we were done last September. This is how it looked over the, the winter um, after the, uh, the snow from February melted. And uh, then this is what it looked like today. So that is um, my experience with rain gardens, limited as it is. We're all impressed at your um, fortitude in digging and digging <laughs> and digging, I think. We had, we had canceled our gym membership last summer, <laughs> so we had to do something. <laughs> um, any other comments regarding this? I think we're going to probably have questions about some of this too, but um, you know, there was a, a, an issue, Laura, you brought this up and I think that this would be a concern for some people. And you said about mosquitoes. So I think mm -hmm. that, you know, obviously individuals would be concerned depending on how um, their uh, testing that Dan did, for example, goes that you might find yourself with standing water for several days at least. And we know that if it's even there for several days, you can have um, insects that breed. Is that really an issue for most people? Or, um, you know, obviously you had a good outcome overall, but I'm wondering if Sean has anything to say or Valerie about people being worried about bugs. Um, if, if your rain garden is holding water long enough for mosquitoes to develop, then it's not engineered properly. Um, the whole idea behind rain gardens is, is infiltration. Um, so ideally, uh, within 24 hours, um, it could go as long as you know 48. Um, if it's holding water much longer than that, um, it's either 
um, engineered improperly. It's in a bad spot. Um, you didn't dig deep enough to, you know, to get a, you know, get to a sand layer. Um, there could be all kinds of reasons why it's not draining properly, but, um, but yeah, if it's not infiltrating water, it's not, it's not doing its job. Okay. Um, yeah, this is John. We've had um, the rain garden for 16 years. Um, uh, and we've never had water standing for, for longer than a few hours. Um, maybe a, the worst one was like half a day. Um, and just to echo what uh, Sean and John have um, mentioned and to kind of also say um, that for um, the mosquitoes to hatch, they need um, seven to um, 12 days um, to um, of uh, stagnant water. And most of your rain gardens are going to drain within 24 to 48. And that's, you know, uh, that's for an extreme case. Um, so again, um, it's for mosquitoes to um, um, to attract and um, yeah, um, actually these rain gardens, another benefit is that it's um, because uh, the flowers and the grasses, they're attracting beneficial insects like your dragonflies that will actually take care of that uh, mosquito issue pretty quickly. So it's attracting beneficials more so than um, bringing them on. Good. I mean, I can just see people, you know, wanting to do this and making themselves pretty well uh, educated about it, but their neighbors may not be. And, you know, the first time they get bit by a mosquito, they think it's your rain garden that did this, not something else that's not highly visible, perhaps like whatever's behind their garage. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, and like I said, we actually had a much greater mosquito problem before we put the rain garden in because the water would sit in the yard for a lot longer and it never seemed to dry out. Whereas now we don't have any mosquito issue at all, virtually. Um, but before we before we had the rain garden, we definitely and we couldn't even go back there because you'd get attacked um, no matter when you went back there. Okay. Again, it is seven to um, 12 days for um, the mosquito eggs to hatch, and, and they do need um, um, stagnant water for that to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, well, you know, sometimes a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and that's all that people may remember is water, bugs, etc. cetera. Um, so is there a minimum size to foster plants properly, would you say? I mean, Dan's is pretty generous and obviously some are even bigger like Laura's, but um, if somebody wants to put in a small garden, how small is maybe just not going to do much at all? Well, I, I have two rain gardens in my front yard. One's about 40 square feet and the other one's 65. Um, I, I would say they're both on the smaller side, but they, they both function really well. So. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, something along those lines is, is kind of the, you know, the, the smaller, uh, smaller size of rain gardens. And I've seen some where they just come off the rain spout. So you might have your downspout and then maybe a connector a little bit out. And that's just kind of a small little patch of area with the right kind of water in the depression and the right kind of plants to help. So they can be smaller. Yeah. <laughs> I think any, um, sometimes your rain gardens, they, um, they, um, your property kind of dictates where you're going to have your rain garden. And it's anywhere that there's a depression or a, a shallow area that the water's gathering. It's a great place. Um, there is like a quick math um, solution where um, if you have a thousand square foot um, area, then you divide it by, it's the third method. So you kind of divide that down um, by a third, which is maybe 350 square feet. So ideally then that could be your rain garden. Um, but um, there is, um, as some people have talked about, like, you know, there is like landscaping or there is a, a engineering process that you can go through with these rain gardens, but it's not necessary. And um, again, um, uh, it's usually the natural flow of your landscape that kind of dictates where your rain garden is going to be. 
um, providing it away from the home, usually like 10 feet away from property. And if you can provide like um, um, a dry creek or some kind of um, way to get that um, um, the water away from your home is ideal and a way for it to be collected. Okay. And then you add those beautiful plants and, and you have um, a beautiful uh, little ecosystem on your property. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> and you have a property that's alive, right? Right. <laughs> Exciting. I think that's one of the questions where um, if people have something that does really well, um, and it doesn't necessarily stray out of the area you've dedicated, but it gets thick. Should these areas or these sites ever be mowed? Uh, yeah, as, absolutely. You can you can mow them. Um, usually, uh, it really depends on your preference. I like leaving my plants up over the winter. Um, it adds some winter interest, and it also provides habitat seed source for you know for wildlife over the mm -hmm. over the winter. Um, you can cut it down in the spring. Um, um, if you if you contract a professional, you can even have it burned if your rain garden's big enough. Um, so you know those are those are some ways to, uh, to to cut it back. I wouldn't I wouldn't do it more than once a year. That that's just my opinion, mm -hmm. my preference. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to build on that. Uh, question um, and see um, those of you who've had the rain gardens for a little bit more time, um, what um, sort of, like if, if you mow, um, that's maintenance. What other, what type of maintenance have other rain garden um, gardeners had to do? Um, we've got, uh, in my case, um, as I said, over a decade and um, we've done very little. We've cut the chaff down in the spring and um, I've done some uh, cutting of woody species um, that, that sneak in there every now and then. But uh, really the only required labor is, is once you're cutting the chaff down um, and, and dealing with that. Otherwise I just let it go. I let the seeds go where they go and the plants move around and migrate and, and it's quite fun to see how it changes. But mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if there's other maintenance um, that people are providing doing to their gardens. I do a bit of maintenance with um, propagating plants. So I both move them where I want them. So if I get a you know bigger selection of them in the next year, I can move them around. But some plants I get too many of. So I have things like obedient plant and Joe pie weed, which I need to control. Otherwise they'll take over the whole space. So that ends up taking some time. Um, but the good thing is you can share them with other people. So that ends up being good work to do. Um, I usually take down the stems in the spring. And then I usually, um, I, I rake once in the fall and put everything into the garden bed. And then I rake once in the spring and take everything out of the garden bed. And that's about it. Okay, okay. no, I think that's really critical info. Um, and it may vary, of course, by the kinds of plants that you find yourself putting in, um, which actually is a question. Um, when I think of water weeds, they could be a bunch of things, but what do you do or what would you expect um, in terms of things that love to be in the water and want to move in? And I'm kind of thinking of you know, if you got a sudden influx of uh, cottonwood saplings, they like to have their feet at least a little moist. Um, that's why you know where water is sometimes is by looking for those trees. Um, so has anybody had to battle um, an invasive species that you didn't invite? Um, I think you always, um, especially when um, establishing these gardens, there may be some invasives that come in um, and cottonwood seedlings would probably be something that you would remove um, when you get, when you're working with these gardens, um, that would be a maintenance issue. Um, and if you get them young enough and IDing um, the plants at a young age is, um, um, it's really not that difficult to just go in there in the early spring to remove them or midsummer, as uh, Ginny had mess, met, mentioned. Um, other, you know, um, I like to keep the four season interest too in keeping that plant material up over the wintertime. Um, 
and uh, chopping and dropping is a great way. It just becomes a uh, natural mulch and um, for uh, people that still have hedge clippers, a great way to still use your hedge clipper, right? <laughs> um, uh, the other maintenance thing might be seed collection in the fall too. Um, and that's a great way to um, keep the integrity of the design in check. Um, there are a few bullies in the garden, maybe um, uh, when you're talking about like a 12 year old um, rain garden that you may wanna spend some time controlling. And that might be your um, goldenrod, solidago, um, that you wanna maybe in the early spring, identify the, um, what it looks like and, and keeping it to that area and then sharing it with um, your neighbor. It's a nice way to build community, right? Um, and, you know, another one is your cup plant and, and just making sure that you have, you have it maybe closer to the center. If it's um, kind of a uh, oval shaped garden, if you're seeing it from all areas, you know, having an idea of where you're um, placing your plants and remembering what they look like. It does get huge, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's lovely. And, and I just um, love the culture and the story behind the cup plants, so. Yeah, Valerie, you mentioned my two biggest um, uh, challenges are goldenrod and cup plant. And yeah. cup plant is a mixed bag because it is beautiful. It's really tall and it, it the goldfinches love it. Um, it's, but it's the ecological very, benefits are just so great. Um, I've had to kind of cut that back, but um, again, I'm not as angry as at it as some non-natives. <laughs> right. So and um, and you know, you know, sometimes it's a, a couple of your um, um, aggressive plants like a big blue stem and cup plant. I've seen those like in in between like a garage and like a property um, area and, and they kind of can battle each other out in that position and they don't have much other places to go. So <laughs> like, um, I guess just um, knowing um, the area, you know, understanding the plant um, and um, right plant, right place um, really helps. And then just um, keeping that design integrity really makes a lot of um, a big difference. Um, and for being neighborhood friendly, maybe you want to provide like that sharp edge to, to make it look like a defined space or even keeping um, a low hedge. And you could do that with a native shrub, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like your Jersey teas or your um, uh, St. John wort. You know, those are some nice low growing hedges that, you know, still have a, will have a formal ed, uh, edge or formal element to the garden. Um, I, I would also add when it comes to the invasives, um, keep in mind that the, the garden is as is dry as much as it is wet. So, um, so you don't always attract the, uh, the wet. Um, invasive species. There are there are, are dry species that you'll you'll see as well. I I personally have been battling thistle in my garden for for a few years. Um, so um, yeah, so you know just just keep your eye out for for anything that that doesn't belong there. Like purple loose strife. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that would be a, a wet area. Mm -hmm. um, I think Sean's comment's really important because it is less of a pond and it is more of a typical garden bed that just happens to fill sometimes and then it does drain. So I would say most of the time the rain garden is going to be dry and not filled with water. So I don't tend to get those types of weeds. I get creeping Charlie and dandelions, violets, things like that. So I know John, you have a plant list and I think maybe some other folks um, have something too. And I was going to ask uh, maybe just for Sean to start here, what kinds of things you would suggest for people um, to start with that uh, are not too fragile, um, you know, don't require a lot of TLC to get them started, but then um, for folks who want to see some color and shape, um, I think there's a fear that, you know, everything's going to be about grass, grass, and grass, and frankly, grass can get boring, even if it's a little blue or a little red. Or So what do you find is a good way to start? And then for the folks who have 
um, added color and structure or shape, texture to their gardens? Um, where did you go with your choices? Well, um, there's there there are three sedges that I that I like to use as kind of a base for for rain gardens. Um, um, uh, Carex pallida, Carex amorei, and Carex volpinoidea. Um, I've I've had a lot of success with those three as kind of a, a base. Um, there are some other sedge species that that do well um, in rain gardens too. Um, and then once that's established, um, you know there there are a few um, native forbs, native wildflowers that I like: um, um, marsh blazing star, swamp milkweed. Uh, cardinal flower is really great. Um, uh, what else? Um, I, I like using a uh, Pinstemon digitalis, uh, foxglove beard tongue. Um, it seems to do pretty well. Um, I'm trying to think what I'm leaving out. Um, uh, uh, great blue uh, lobelia does well um, in rain gardens too. I'm sure some other folks have uh, species that they they prefer. And I was um, just going to follow that, uh, Sean, with the question from the uh, chat. Um, someone had asked them. Um, does, uh, when the rain garden gets inundated with water, is that going to kill all the plants? But the, the fact is, these plants can tolerate some mm -hmm. flooding. Correct. So yeah. So um, so so natives can be tricky because you know um, it, it's tough to find natives that um, that can tolerate the range of a rain garden. But mm -hmm. there are you know there are enough of them that are that are hardy um, uh, that can tolerate a little bit of dryness, a little bit of wetness. And we'll sort of thrive in that in that sort of uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Plus, the rain garden drains more quickly than than typical soil, so the uh, plants won't be sitting in water as long. Correct. As yeah. So, so it's not the rain gardens typically typically aren't saturated. They're saturated during certain times of the year. You know, spring. Um, sometimes, if you have you know we have a wet spell in the, the summer, you know, a week of rain or something like that, it may uh, it may hold it won't hold water, but it may stay moist. Um, but for the most part, they're they're dry most of the year. So, um, so um, so um, species that would do you know like like strictly wetland species typically don't do well in rain gardens. Um, you want something that uh, that can take you know like I said a little bit of wetness, a little bit of dryness. And it is that root system that's deep digging deep into the soil profile that's really making all the difference um, and that and why it can take the floods as well as the drought because the drought um, when they're digging deep into that um, um, let's see um, Joe pie weed may be four feet above ground but that root system's going down at least 10 feet into our soil profile and amending it and um, filtering that water um, as well as getting water during our droughts um, and uh, during the drought times and finding that um, resource down below. So it, it acts like a kind of like a big sponge too, which is which is exactly. Great. Yeah, for sure. They're also sequestering carbon down below. Mm -hmm. John, did you have anything that you just couldn't get to be happy. I mean, you know, something that you really liked and you tried to put it in and it just never wanted to be where you put it. Um, oh, were you asking me that question? I'm sorry. Actually, both you and John would, I, or anybody would be welcome to comment on this. Um, I, I, I mean, I would say, um, Yes, um, I wouldn't say there's a there's a specific species that just doesn't do well in rain gardens. I would say that um, it, it depends on um, like sun aspect. You know, if you have a little bit of shade, if you have full sun. Um, there's been times where you know I've I've wanted to put color into you know a, a certain a certain species that I know would add color to a rain garden. Um, but it was just not sunny enough. Um, and, um, you know, where that species may have done well in a, in a full sun situation in, in a rain garden, um, with just a little bit of shade, it doesn't. So um, it, it really just depends on site and, um, um, you know, the, the condition of the area where you're, where, where you're installing your rain garden. Sun and soil type is key. You know, I have a couple pictures and a couple recommendations. And even though there are like some native bullies um, in the garden, like our um, 
cup plant and um, goldenrod. Um, there are a lot that are, you know, a little more well-behaved or, you know, I guess um, that um, like uh, the sedges that uh, Sean has mentioned. And um, anyways, I can share a couple pictures if people would like to take a peek. Please. I think, let's see. Okay. Oh, this is one of our rain gardens um, in Oak Park, I believe. So this is uh, the, the Bully Rain Garden at Trailside Museum that um, our master naturalists and conservation at home members um, uh, revamped in recent years. So this is what it looked like in the native, um, it was natively planted uh, probably 20 years ago. And it kind of went um, a little, um, it was kind of left to its own devices, I should say. <laughs> um, here are master gardeners and uh, uh, master naturalists uh, kind of cleared out the area and kept some of the plants that um, discovered some of the plants that were there and you could kind of see um, a witch hazel in the corner and some uh, uh, what is it red twig dogwood as well as some um, other forbs and you could see where why there would be so much flooding with um, three downspouts coming out and here in this last picture if you can see it can you see it mm -hmm. yeah. yes um, okay um, uh, where they added some uh, permeable pavers and directed that rainwater with uh, rain barrels or capturing some of it, as well as directing it out um, with a um, dry creek and then layering the plant material. So you have the witch hazel, you have um, some, uh, uh, some of the hydrangeas as well as um, the uh, uh, other shrubs, and then um, you have your forbs, your uh, flowers, as well as your grasses, as well, and sedges in the foreground. So knowing your zones, your wet zone, your moist zone, and your dry with your rain gardens is helpful. And this is information from uh, Wisconsin's Extension Service. They have a big um, a lot of uh, a really good resource on rain gardens that goes into great detail. Um, here are some native plants that do well in moist areas as well as full sun conditions. Uh, the lobelia that Sean has mentioned, um, actually royal fern will do well um, in some shaded areas too as an understory. A uh, late season plant would be your New, late, New England Aster. Midsummer Bloom, um, your Black Eyed Susans are fun. And um, Liatris is always beautiful. <laughs> uh, your dry zones, so um, plants that will thrive in drier areas. Um, definitely your Bee Balm. Rattlesnake Master is a great structure plant. Um, a little hard to take um, in the residential zone, but um, if you pair it next to um, a, a, a nice uh, grass or like something, I think Rattlesnake Master next to um, one of your panicums might be really beautiful. Can, wait, that one have, um, oh no, that's, I'm sorry. Um, again, this is your wet zone, and um, these are all plants that will do well in uh, water in um, the zone that's very close to where the water is going to gather, and they will do well in dry conditions too. But your swamp milkweed, uh, sneezeweed, I absolutely love that plant. Blooms until there's a hard frost. In your cardinal plants, um, they also do really well um, for. Um, they have that milky sap um, that a lot of your milkweeds have. So um, the mammals, so if you have troubles with deer or rabbits, they kind of have a tendency to stay away from that sap, um, that milky. Yeah, 
So that's what I have. Okay. Well, Val, you uh, shared with me a very good, um, um, uh, I think it was a page from the Creating Rain Gardens book that shows the tests um, for do-it-yourselfers to, uh, to test the quality of their soil for rain gardens. Oh, um, you can, uh, the ribbon test or the drainage? Uh, the, the, the drainage test and the, and the ribbon test. And I was looking through my email for that and I cannot find it. Hmm. Um, so you have it on hand. Let me see if I... Oh, the um, just that resource in yes, yes, okay, yeah. There were questions about that. I thought um, we're going a little long, um, so I appreciate you all um, for staying with us. Um, I thought we should go through some of the questions in the chat. Some of them have been answered uh, directly, but I thought it would be worth, um, you know, in terms of general interest, um, addressing some of them. Um, oh, here it is. This uh, is the resource. Yes. Um, this is, uh, um, I did share this with Daniel and there's also another, um, good resource, um, from our C grant and Illinois extension service, um, that talks all about, um, rain gardens and how to build one and, um, some plant su suggestions also. And this is from, um, the, um, this is, uh, taken from the, uh, which book is that? Um, I, I have it right here. I think you have it, right? Okay. Yeah, I, I have it up on the screen here. Okay. So I'll share that. So it's uh, Creating Rain, Rain Gardens by, um, I'm not sure the author's last name's Unkafer and um, Wolf Erskine, maybe. Um, but um, I'll put a link to the uh, to this in the chat. Is, oh, I think I already did put a link in, in the chat to, to the publisher's page. I think it's available at, uh, through Amazon. Um, I got a copy from the Riverside Library. So it's available there as well. So Dan, have you got the key to the questions? Well, let's um, go through some of them. Um, I see the panelists have been very good about addressing them as we go, but uh, we'll, we'll read them off uh, from the chat. So the first question was about um, the rain exchange system, which I think Laura has already ex um, explained how that works. It's a reservoir under the yard that stores um, excess rainwater and it's used in addition to um, the rain garden in her yard. Um, can you put a rain garden in the front yard? Definitely yes. Um, John has one, Sean has one. Um, there, uh, there is some consideration for the neighbor's reaction to it. Uh, seems if you put a strip of grass around it, it makes it more um, palatable, um, mm -hmm. looks more intentional. <laughs> I actually have uh, landscape timbers around mine, so it just looks like an extension of my planting bed. Mm -hmm. And we yeah, I think as long as a bad comment from anybody. <laughs> no, I bet not. <laughs> yeah, I think as long as it looks purposeful, you're okay, right? right. Um, so this is an interesting question. Um, uh, one of the uh, participants asked, uh, she wants to put a sump pump um, into a new rain garden, um, but the building inspector said, um, that you can't because the code says the sump pump discharge has to be within five feet of the house. Sean, that might be a question for you. Have you encountered any local ordinances? In terms no, of I'm, I, uh, I direct all of my sump water into a rain garden in my backyard. Um, it is within, I, I guess it does, it does spit out within five feet of my house and kind of takes a channel into the rain garden. The rain garden mm -hmm. itself isn't that close, but um, mm -hmm. Um, my, yeah, my, my, the, the rain garden I have in my backyard is kind of um, located up against the property line and mm -hmm. all of my sump water goes into it. Um, and I've, I've never heard of a code that would, um, you know, not allow that. So maybe the issue is that um, the, uh, the village doesn't want people discharging water all the way to their property line, mm -hmm. but you could discharge your sump pump um, within five feet of the house and then use a swale Correct. To bring the water. Yep. To that's the, exactly to the right Yep. Okay. That's uh, situation too. Ah, all right. So moving on then, we we're knocking these questions off one by one. Um, okay. We talked about uh, flooding doesn't necessarily destroy the rain garden. Uh, you have plants that can tolerate it and the soil will drain quickly. Um, so this is an interesting question. Uh, um, so there, there's a slope on the side of this uh, participant's house to prevent water coming downhill from the neighbors that was seeping into the basement. The soil is clay. Um, they were thinking of building a swale 
um, with a less permeable base that would permeable base that would direct water downhill in the direction they want. Um, they were thinking about putting uh, richer soil above it and then fill it with plants. Um, oh, so they're wondering if uh, um, uh, uh, they say the Pacassandra is um, already established in the swale that diverts water away from their house. And uh, they're run wondering if they're on the right track by uh, growing Pacassandra in oh, the sorry. swale. Can I interrupt? Yes. The Pacassandra is not in the swale. The oh. Pacis, I, I dug out Pacassandra to end, where I was engineering. Ah, uh, okay. Area, so I got rid of the Pacassandra. I'm not sure if that was a good idea or a bad idea. Maybe it was soaking up more water than I thought. I don't know. But now I have um, a sloped dry stream bed that actually sends the water onto my neighbor's property and then back onto mine. Mm. <laughs> wow, you have, a, you have a kind neighbor. Well, it's only way at the bottom. for a Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. It, okay. it, it goes down my slope. Mm. So it's, uh, what, um, I guess, what would be the, what could help uh, Margie's situation? I'll open that up to any panelist. Well, I would say um, in regard to the Pakistandra specifically, um, so Pakistandra is a non-native, um, it's, um, um, it's very shallow rooted. Um, so it doesn't do a whole lot for, for water, water infiltration. Yeah, that's what I thought. But most of the Pakistandra in my property I ripped out. Sure. So it sounds it like um, my neighbors. He's got all the pack of sand. Hmm. Gotcha. It sounds like you've created um, a, a dry stream bed, um, which which is great for conveying water, um, but it doesn't do much for for infiltration. So um, I, without seeing a, a plan of your uh, of your property, it's it's tough for me to, to to speculate. But if there was a way that you can convert some of that dry stream bed into a into a rain garden, um, that may help infiltrate the water before it has a chance to even get to your neighbor's property and eventually back on yours. Oh, the water that's going out to his house. Oh, that's intentional. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that's trying to keep his. No, I'm just trying to keep his water on his property. <laughs> I got you. All right. <laughs> that, that's yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, this sounds and then I like... let it eventually drain back into mine. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. All right. Well, let's um uh, let's move on because I I know we want to wrap up uh, sooner than later. Um. So there was a question: What is a swale? And we've talked about a swale a number of times. Um. Uh. The this evening a swale. Um. As Ginny wrote, is a depressed garden bed. Um. Usually long with curved edges. Um. Which helps direct the water and increases um, surface. Um, absorption. So the, the swale is really to channel the water. It, it helps with drain, um, with absorption, but it's to uh, to move the water somewhere else on the property, ideally to a, a rain garden, I suppose would be the best way to put it, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. it directs the water to where you want it. Okay. And so this, um, th this um, how do you determine the capacity of your rain garden needed? Um, that's probably more than we need to, we, we can get into in the time remaining, but there is mathematics to it. Yeah, it, I mean, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, how much space do you have? How much, how much rainwater? Do you, what size of a storm event do you want to account for? Um, basically, it just it comes down to math. You, you figure out how much water is landing on your property, um, and then whether or not you have enough space to account for um, infiltrating all that water. So it's just a matter of, of doing the math. Right, and that, that uh, and creating rain, rain gardens book we recommended um, will walk you through that step by step. And on that handout too, it also gives like three different formulas on calculating if if you'd like to do that. Hmm. So the next question was, oh, I'm sorry, did I interrupt someone? Oh, this is Yvonne. I just wanted to be sure that if we do have 60 seconds left, that something that um, Jenny said I think it, we haven't really discussed, and maybe it's for some other time, mm -hmm. but and that has to do with what kind of wildlife benefits. Uh, I mean, people think about birds mm -hmm. and seeds, but I'm wondering, you know, do you see other things that you didn't used to see before? 
it's it's great for pollinators, um, you know, butterflies, um, dragonflies, um, you know, all kinds of insects um, and, and birds. So those those are kind of the main things I, I typically see. Um, but um, you know, small you see small mammals, uh, particularly in the winter time, they may uh, they may overwinter in some of the the thicker vegetation. Um, yeah, you see a little bit of everything. There are some plants that have. Um... What, uh, pollinators that love them. So there's milkweed beetles that go to the milkweed and there's aphids mm. that go to swamp milkweed. And sometimes it's alarming because it looks like they're overtaking it, but it's just natural for those plants. And with those bugs come the birds and it's, it's beautiful. There's so much biodiversity that comes with each of those natives that you add. Um, the question came up, do you need a permit to build a rain garden? Um, I had a brush with the law myself and uh, um, learned that I didn't need a permit to build a rain garden. Um, it may be different if we had brought in uh, heavy equipment and a dump truck, but uh, with hand tools, um, the uh, ordinance allows for you to, to dig in your yard and do some minor regrading uh, without a permit. Um, Sean, you probably can speak to the bigger projects. Sure. Um, it all depends on 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 scale. Um, so typically, on the for the residential scale, if you're not sending water off your prop, more water off your property after the, the whatever the construction you're doing is, um, then you don't need a. You typically don't need a uh, permit. Okay. So if you're if you're if you're keeping if you're adding capacity, generally it's it's okay. And a large part of our rain garden is actually in the the. Um, Public, the village property, um, so we had to get permission, and and they had to give approval to our plant list. Mm. Okay. And any time that you dig, you do want to know where those utilities are coming in. So um, just to be on the safe side, Julie or um, that uh, eight um, eight one one number for the city of uh, Chicago. It's it's super beneficial. They'll come out. They'll do it within like twenty four hours, or I'm sorry, forty eight hours. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good to know. We did not uh, call Julie, but uh, we were lucky, I guess. And I, <laughs> everything was overhead, so <laughs> they get well, very grumpy if you cut something. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure I would have been very grumpy if I'd been shocked. Um, <laughs> So um, I don't know that we'll get to all the questions. I'll just try to go through rapidly. Um, a lot of them have been answered in the chat, but uh, just I think they're worth commenting on. Um, so uh, engineered soil, um, we talked a little bit about that. Um, it's, it's a mix of sand, compost, and um, topsoil, as I understand it. It's ideal, yeah. Okay. Planting soil any, in any <laughs> garden. <laughs> okay. And then... Um, We'll, we will compile a list of resources to share on the, the link to this um, chat, this, um, I'm sorry, this uh, presentation will be on uh, the Olmsted Society website. We can also provide some links to other resources. Um, uh, there was a question about the, uh, the, the soil tests um, that's in the book, Creating Rain Gardens and uh, Val also has a handout on that. Um, let's see, um, we can provide plant lists. Um, in terms of getting the plants, I know the, um, the Wheaton just had their annual uh, native plant sale um, where you can, uh, um, where they offer um, natives at, at a great price. Unfortunately, it's an annual sale and it was last weekend. Um, so we'll have to wait a year for that. Um, what about um, sources like uh, the True Value, you know, LaGrange True Value hardware, or is it an Ace, Ace Hardware in LaGrange Park or the um, Menards, are, are home centers a good source of, uh, Plants uh, and rain gardens. Um, they, they can be. Um, typically, they're not. They're not great sources for natives. I mean, they mm -hmm. do. They'll, they'll have, um, you know, uh, uh, purple cone flower, black eyed susan, that sort of thing. Some of the native grasses. Um, there's some. There's some great online sources as well. Um, Prairie Moon Nursery, Prairie Nursery. Um, you can mm -hmm. get. You can get native plugs um, delivered to your house. Mm -hmm. Um, the ex, uh, extension, we um, compile a list of um, 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 eco-friendly landscapers. So, Sean, I need your contact information, <laughs> as well as nurseries and different growers um, throughout our um, Cook County region. 
and and just out, outside of them, and as well as other websites that are wonderful to go to. Um, but definitely local growers, Possibility Place is one, um, but Midwest Ground Cover is another one um, that does have a native um, selection. I'd also recommend like community groups. Um, I posted a couple Facebook groups on the page. I pretty much started my garden with the Lake County <laughs> gardening group. I snuck myself in there and some people give away plants because they have to manage their own gardens and they need a place for it to go. So I drove up to Lake County, brought home a bunch of Joe Pye weed and it's a great way to share. So um, if you can find yourself a, a community like that, it's a way to propagate plants that are sometimes a little bigger than those smaller ones that you get at the native sales. So it's a good way to find them. All right. Native plant sales, definitely the spring and like they're kind of selling out. It's uh, we we're a partner with um, West Cook Wild Ones um, and we're like tapped. Um, yep. Thank you, Margie. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and then but we do have it twice a year. So we will have a tree and shrub uh, focus um, come the fall. Um, but it's, it's a good problem to have. I'm glad that there's such an interest in native plants now because um, it does uh, really help for this, for our ecosystem, right? To, to get these pollinators up and going again. And it's amazing, you plant it and they come, right? And, and it, the water gets absorbed and it, you know, and there's beauty. It's a win-win. Yes. Mm -hmm. For so many reasons for ourselves, right? For our humanity. <laughs> well, we are um, at an hour and a half. Um, so I thank everyone for, for their time. No, I, I think it was, it was a great conversation and there was a lot of information. So there was no point in, in rigidly cutting it off at, at an hour. But I think um, we are, we're ready to wrap things up. Um, I, hopefully, we, hopefully we got to everyone's um, questions or the majority of them. Um, as I said, resources will be available on the FLOSS website as well as a recording of this entire uh, discussion. Um, so Yvonne, do you um, have anything to add? I, well, I just wanted to say this is a lot of good advice. Um, and I think that we really kept the crowd riveted um, or rooted to their place. <laughs> um, and I want to thank all of our um, panelists tonight. I think you're going to find that uh, people will be picking your brains um, when they see you, uh, encounter you, or write to you. Um, so you've gotten, you've gotten yourself some more email commitments, I think, uh, mm -hmm. just with the passage of 90 minutes. Um, and I lastly, but uh, wanted to mention for anyone who's listening, um, if there's other subjects you'd like to hear about, um, or even to tell us that, you know, this is something that maybe should recur periodically as a topic, um, let us know at the Olmstead website. All right, thanks. Yeah, I, I, um, as the uh, coordinator um, of this um, panel discussion um, and the uh, presentations for the Olmstead Society, I definitely want to thank uh, Jenny Hogarth, um, John Hoagland, um, Sean Sin, Avail Kehoe, um, Laura Rubio, um, and Yvonne um, as, our, uh, as our moderator tonight. Um, and I'm also going to promote our next um, presentation, which will take place in May. It's um, Jazz Age Modern, Riverside's Art Deco and Art Modern Houses. That includes uh, some houses done in the international style. Um, we worked with a, a team of UIC students this past uh, winter who um, did a study of those houses built between 1920s and 1940s that have a kind of distinctive you know, jazz age um, vision of what a modern house uh, looks like. Um, so that'll be coming up in May, um, also co-sponsored through the library um, and also on Yay! Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and with, the, with that, um, thank you all for attending tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, was correct. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Good night.